All right, well, this morning we're turning back to a, a, a passage that we've looked at before for another reason, uh, and we're going to focus on a particular word uh, in this text, the word if, okay? If means that there's a condition, you know, this will be true if this is true, okay? So let me read it. I'll remind you of what we've already looked at here briefly, and then we'll push on. So 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26. Paul writes to Timothy, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Now, you may recognize this passage. We did look at it before. It reminds us that the devil tries to confuse us as far as uh, our, our perception of truth and righteousness and what's good and bad. Uh, look at the world around us and, and we'll look at what they're calling good. Look at what they're protecting. That is really the enemy at work. And obviously, uh, Paul's telling Timothy he's going to run into people like that and this is the way he needs to approach them that they might come to their senses Okay, they might be able to see things the way they should see them and escape the snare of the devil having been held captive by him. He's captivated their minds and their hearts. Okay? But what we want to focus on this morning is this word if. If, he says, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance. Okay? And the point there is that repentance is the gift of God. It's, it's by His grace, by His almighty power. It's not something that just anybody can do. So, um, I think, um, <laughs> kind of maybe jumped ahead a little bit, but in our passage, again, Paul is impressing on Timothy the importance of not being argumentative. And I, I thought it would be worth just, you know, landing on that just for a moment. When dealing with those who are opposing the truth, you know, don't be argumentative. He says, instead, correct them with kindness and patience and gentleness. Now, he's calling Timothy, as, as we are also called in our own way. Timothy was an evangelist. He was a pastor. We don't all have the same responsibilities Timothy had, but we do have opportunities, and we need to approach those opportunities in the way that Paul would tell Timothy to do the same, and that is to be an example of Christ to, to others, uh, not... You know, if somebody comes to you arguing, we're not to return evil for evil, you know, blow for blow, but we're to return a blessing instead. We're not to respond in kind, but to exhibit a gracious, Christ-like character, because this is the kind of spirit that the Lord more often uses to bring those involved in sin to repentance, to bring them to their senses, okay, that they might see the right way that they might be led to the knowledge of the truth, to Jesus, that they might be saved. Now, that's an important lesson by itself, and perhaps enough has been said about that already, but really, when you, if somebody comes, it gets worked up when you're, you know, trying to share the gospel, trying to minister to them, if you just remain calm and patient and kind, generally, they'll calm down and you'll have an opportunity. Just don't get into a heated debate with anyone. But what Brooks draws our attention to more particularly this morning is that condition of repentance, which really a lot of folks within the church tend to miss, but that Paul is speaking of here. And again, let me just remind you in verse 25, he says to Timothy, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. Repentance is something that God gives. It's, it's a gift of His grace. It's not something that anyone can do. Now, Paul is not telling Timothy here that if he says the right things and he exhibits the right kind of character, that they will be brought to repentance. God must act to bring it about because we can't repent in our own strength. It's only possible by the grace of God. That is the, the point of, of this particular um, message. So this brings us to the devil's deception. Repentance 
is easy. So the devil may come to us and argue with us, you know, don't worry about that particular sin you're being tempted with. If you, if you commit it, whatever it is, and, and maybe there'll be the exception of the unpardonable sin, all right? Um, God will forgive you. You only have to repent, just confess your sin and ask forgiveness. So what's the problem? Just do it, okay? Now, you remember that, maybe you remember a, a couple of weeks ago, I used the illustration of a friend that I had in Calvary Chapel and how um, we were talking about, you know, what, what we would do in a case if we were confronted with somebody who was going to injure us, if, if we, you know, if we wanted to talk to them about Christ or uh, maybe they'd get upset, you know, and what we should do in a case like that. And so this particular individual said, if I was confronted with somebody who was going to do me bodily harm, if, uh, if I identified as a Christian, I would just simply deny Christ. And then later, I would repent and ask God for forgiveness. And this guy considered himself to be quite a godly man, quite a, a prophet. Actually, Calvary Chapel has uh, prophets. And uh, so, but the idea is you can't just deny Christ and then expect him to forgive you, although he may, because we, are, we do have times where we are weak, and if we truly belong to him, he, he will grant to us uh, forgiveness if we belong to him. But that's the wrong kind of reasoning. You see, that's exactly what the devil is trying to teach us to do. Now, Brooks tells us that the problem with this reasoning is simply this, that you can't take repentance for granted. Repentance is something God alone can give us the grace to do. Now, we all know, I believe, that this is true of unbelievers. Okay? We know, as Jesus says in John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, oftentimes this is taken as permission. No one can, you know, has permission to come to me unless the Father gives that permission, but he's given it to everyone so everyone can come. That's not what Jesus is saying here. He says no one can come to me. No one has the ability, the power. He's not able to do so. Okay? To come to me, and that means uh, here to turn from their sins, because what does it mean to come to Jesus Christ? You have to turn from your sins, and you have to trust in Him. We call that conversion. You know, turn around, you're going the wrong way, turn around, start going the right way, go to Christ, follow Him. That includes repentance, doesn't it? You have to turn. To turn to Christ, you've got to turn away from sin at the same time. And, of course, when the, when the Father is drawing, that's exactly what He does. But notice Jesus says, no one can come to me. No one can repent. No one can believe in me, He says, unless the Father who sent me draws Him. And that simply means unless He grants that grace by His Holy Spirit. Now, I would wager that most unbelievers who have heard the gospel think they can come to Jesus at any time, that they can repent and believe. They have the power to do that whenever they want just by praying the sinner's prayer. And the reason why they believe that is because many well-meaning Christians, that's what they're teaching. That's, that's the popular view. Now, it is true that if anyone calls on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. That's what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10 in verse 13. But remember that that calling on the name of the Lord has to be sincere. It has to be from the heart. It has to be because they hate their sin and they want the Lord Jesus Christ. And they can't do that. They can't have those desires unless the, Spirit, or unless the Lord gives them His Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Before you can see the kingdom of heaven and enter into the kingdom of heaven, you need the new birth of the Holy Spirit. That is exactly what Jesus is referring to when He says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And by the way, that's the reason why the vast majority of people who hear the gospel put it off, and they don't repent, and they don't believe, because they think they can do it at any time, and they don't really want Jesus. And that's why they keep putting it off. And oftentimes they put it off until it's too late. Uh, thinking again that on my deathbed I can pull out sinner's prayer, I can pray it, can still make it into heaven under the wire. But the fact is, we don't know when we're going to die. We don't know how we're going to die. We don't know, you know, that we're even going to reach that point. But also, we can't suddenly begin to love the Lord and hate sin on our deathbed. 
Okay, if we haven't done that our entire lives, we haven't done it because we're born dead in trespass and sin. We still need the new birth even when it comes to that point. Now, we know that's true, okay? But Brooks is pointing out to us this morning, this book is directed towards people who are professing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and not just to unbelievers. And his point is that we often forget as believers that the same thing is true of us. We can't repent without God's grace. And that means we should never take it for granted. Okay, if we've repented, it's only because of His grace. But we don't want to take it for granted that, you know, that repentance. We can't just assume on God's grace every time we sin that we will be able to repent. And let me just give you what I think is behind this. Now, for the believer, for those that are pursuing righteousness through hate sin and are pursuing Christ, we all fall and we stumble and many times uh, in our lives we're going to be going up and down and up and down. But as we're pursuing these things, we, we are used to the fact that God gives us grace. He most often gives us this grace to repent and praise God that He does. His almighty power is still being exercised toward us. But we have to admit, sometimes He does withhold it, even from true believers, and lets them stumble and, and fall and grope around in the dark for a while to teach them just how dangerous that sin is, okay? We, so, again, we don't want to take that for granted that we are going to be able to repent. Sometimes God does give us over to our sin. Our confession talks about that to, uh, to chasten us, to discipline us, but it's always out of His love. He's trying to teach us. But then there's that third category of people that I do think Brooks does address here as well, and that is there are people in the church who can't repent, because they really don't know him. And so they're the, also those that should not take this for granted, you know, the fact that they can turn any time. But that puts them in the category of the unbeliever. But they're, I mean, we recognize, as, as the Bible recognizes in Romans chapter 11, the olive tree with the various branches of believing Jews and Gentiles, they're just professing belief because there are branches that can be broken off of that tree and put out of, of the church, and they may never come back. So the church is a mixed group. Not every church, but most churches are. And so this is a warning to those who would fall in that category as well. So the point is we don't want to take this mercy for granted, especially to the point where we begin to excuse our sin on the basis of the fact that God will grant us this repentance. So what does Brooks tell us to do about this? Okay, well, first of all, he reminds us that repentance is beyond our natural ability. Okay, remember what Jesus, there are several quotes from Jesus we could use here. I've already given you one. No one can come to me unless the Father sent me. Draws him, but here's another one. In John 6, 63, same context. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. This is in the context of who can come to him and who can't come to him. Why? Many of them wanted to withdraw, and why the disciples, the twelve, stuck with them, except one of them being a devil, is because it's the Spirit who gives life. Jesus understood that everyone that the Father had granted that gift, they would come to Him, but those who wouldn't, they were going to depart. And it, it, I'm sure that it, it grieved His heart at some level, because uh, He is the Savior who loves all mankind at a certain level. But He's giving the rationale here. The Spirit gives life. That's sovereignly in His hands. The flesh profits nothing. That means as we come into the world, we cannot repent and believe. We cannot come to Christ. That's the reason why this vast crowd that He had fed, the 5,000, departed. It's beyond our natural ability. Repentance requires God's power. Brooks would say the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that raised His physical body back to life. That same power must be uh, well, must be given to us, must be exercised on our behalf to raise our souls to life. Now, Brooks writes this. He says, you are as well able to melt adamant. Adamant something we're not really familiar with, and actually they weren't either. It was just a mythological rock that was impenetrable, indestructible. You couldn't melt it. You couldn't change its form. He says, you are as well able to melt adamant or do something that's impossible as to melt your own heart to turn a stone into flesh as to turn your own heart to the Lord, 
to raise the dead and to make a world as to repent. You could more easily raise somebody who is dead to life and create a world as you can repent. He further writes this, Repentance is a flower that doesn't grow in nature's garden. Repentance is a gift that comes down from heaven. Men are not born with repentance in their hearts as they are born with tongues in their mouths. Acts 5.31, Peter writes, or says this, preaches this before the, the Jewish leaders. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Again, repentance has to be given. It has to be granted. And he's speaking here, I don't think of natural Israel, although some of these are natural Israelites, but the true Israel of God, those whom, whom the Father has chosen and whom he will bring to life by his almighty power. He continues, it is not in the power of any mortal to repent at pleasure. Some ignorant, deluded souls vainly believe that these five words, Lord, have mercy upon me, are efficacious to send them to heaven. But as, many as, but, but as many are undone by buying a counterfeit jewel, so many are in hell by mistake of their repentance. And you know what? We could, we could put the sinner's prayer in there because that's exactly what this is. Lord, have mercy upon me. We're, we're taught that if we just simply pray that prayer, we'll be saved. Now, it is true if you pray that prayer sincerely from the heart because you really want Christ, because you really want to turn from your sins, yes, God will hear that. But of course, if you can pray that from the heart, you've already trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've already been born again. Okay, but the point is, it's beyond our natural power. Secondly, repentance is more than what most people believe it is. Uh, Brooks, I'm not sure if they had this movement in his day, but in our day, repentance has been redefined. I told you I went to a college that believed this, that repentance is changing your mind about who Jesus is. You thought he was a, you know, maybe a crazy man, but now you see he's the Lord. Ah, but you don't have to bow down to him. You don't have to serve him. You don't have to repent of your sins. You just have to change your mind about who Jesus is and just simply trust in him. And you can trust him, but never follow him. And, and that's fine. Well, that's not what repentance is, and we must repent. If we are saved, we will repent. So repentance is more than what most people believe it is. Now, those in the new members class, we actually went through this not too long ago. You'll remember that there's four elements to a saving repentance. We need to know what God requires. We need to know the law, the standard we've broken. We need to acknowledge that we have broken it. I, okay, it tells me I need to honor my parents. I haven't honored my parents. So I confess, you know, I have broken it. I need to acknowledge that. I need to be sorry, grieved that I have offended God, whom I love, by committing these sins, by breaking his commandments. And that I need to hate that sin and turn away from it and begin doing the right thing resolving never to commit that sin again, okay? Now, we may commit that sin again, and we do commit that sin again, perhaps many times, but when we repent of it, our purpose isn't, I'm going to turn from it just temporarily until the next time I have the desire that I'm going to do it again, but repentance means I'm going to turn away from it and not do it again, okay? That's, that's what repentance is. Now, those who don't have grace can know the standard and they can admit they've broken it, but they can't really be sorry and grieve that they've offended God and they can't purpose in their hearts not to do it again and they can't turn into the, into the right path and begin doing the right thing, which is the opposite of the wrong thing that they're doing. That's something only God can give. So that's saving repentance. And another thing that we tend to forget about saving repentance is that we don't just repent from one sin or 9 out of 10 or 99 out of 100, but from every sin. You know, even unbelievers can hate some of their sins and turn from them. But only believers will hate them all and turn from them all. Because, as Jonathan Edwards pointed out, if you hate sin 
then you'll hate every sin, right? Just as if you love righteousness, then you'll love all that is made up of righteousness. So if you say, I hate sin, but I'm holding on to one of them and I'm enjoying doing this and I'm not repenting of it, even though I'm turning from these others, you're not turning from these others because you hate sin. You're turning from them from some other reason. Because if you hated sin, you would turn from that one you're holding on to. So it's got to be across the board. Now, John Gerstner had this illustration I thought was helpful. He says, an unconverted person is like a house that's on fire inside. And it's constantly filling with smoke. You've seen, you know, the images on television, you know, movie where the house is on fire. The smoke represents, he says, within the house, corruption. The house is full of smoke. It's full of corruption. Opening the windows of the house is like letting the smoke out or letting that corruption flow out towards certain sins. Those are the sins that this person who's represented by the burning house, those are the sins he's committing. Now, he might be able to shut one or more of those windows, but the problem is um, because the house is, con is constantly filling up with smoke, he's got to open another house or another window to let some of that out. So he can cut off one or more of his sins, maybe because those sins are costing him something, not because he's grieving God, because he loves God. Um, he still loves his sin, but the sin is costing him something, maybe reputation. Maybe it's going to cost him his marriage. You know, it depends on what the sin might be. So he turns away from it for that reason, but not for the right reason. But he can't close all the windows. He can't close them all because because the house is full of smoke. It's got to be let out in some way. So even if he's successful in shutting one window or another, he's always going to open another window and let it go out that direction because there's just too much smoke. There's just too much sin that he has to sin. He can't stop it. Believers, on the other hand, would say, he would say, this, they're like a house in which the fire has been put out inside. There's still some smoke in there, you know, but it's, it's being purified. Uh, but all the windows can be shut, and they don't have to be opened. Now, we do crack them open sometimes, sadly, but we can shut them, and we cannot asphyxiate, so to speak, uh, because the Lord has put, those, uh, put that fire of our corruption out. It's, sin has been put to death, and now we have the Spirit of God living within us. So I hope you see the, uh, the illustration there. So the Westminster Confession puts it this way, because we're defining repentance. This is in chapter 15, sections 1 and 2. Repentance unto life is an evangelical grace. That means it's a gift of God. The doctrine whereof is to be preached by every minister of the gospel as well as that of faith in Christ. Faith and repentance, okay? Two flip sides. By it, a sinner out of the sight and sense, not only of the danger, but also of the filthiness and odiousness of his sins, as contrary to the holy nature and righteous law of God, and upon the apprehension of his mercy in Christ to such as are penitent, so grieves for and hates his sin as to turn from them all unto God, purposing and endeavoring to walk with him in all the ways of his commandments. It says exactly what we've just been looking at. We turn from all of our sins. We don't turn, say, I'm going to, I'll just go back when it's convenient for me, but turn away from it once and for all, even though we may fail to do that, but it's across the board. And we do it because we love righteousness and we hate sin. Now, thirdly, he says repentance is something that is continued. It continues throughout life. It's not just a one-time act. He writes that Anselm in his meditations confess, this is regard to Anselm himself, that his whole life was either damnable for sin committed or unprofitable for good omitted and at last concluded, quote, oh, what then remains but in our whole life to lament the sins of our whole life? Okay, that sounds rather gloomy. But that is what repentance is, isn't it? I've done so many things that dishonor the Lord. I have left out so many things that the Lord calls me to do. And every time those things are brought to our minds, we're going to think, oh, yeah, you know, just I wish that I'd use my life better, okay? 
Well, that's a part of, of repentance. It's something that is continual. Brooks tells us that, there, you know, that those who are repentant always have something to turn from, and they can never get close enough to God. Because remember, we're turning away from, running away from Him, and we're running towards Him in, in, this, you know, in our lives, with how we live our lives. There's always going to be something. He writes this, it's no transient act, repentance, but a continued act of the soul. And tell me, O tempted soul, whether it be such an easy thing as Satan would make you believe, to be every day turning more and more from sin and turning nearer and nearer to God, your, choice, your choicest blessedness. A true penitent can as easily content himself with one act of faith or one act of love as he can content himself with one act of repentance. So again, we're continually trusting in the Lord. That's not a one-time thing. You don't just trust in Jesus one time in your life. You do that every day of your life. And you don't just love him once. You love him every day. And in the same way, you don't just repent once. You repent every single day. And he says, we see this in the saints. David was still lamenting about his sins in Psalm 25, verse 7, where he prays, do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. And of course, Paul, the greatest of the apostles, the greatest evangelist who ever lived outside of Christ, he writes this close to the end of his death to Timothy. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Not I was, but I am. So he was still lamenting sins of his life, everything that he had done. He tried to destroy the church, remember, and had many of the saints. He was casting his vote against them as they were being put to death. He was still lamenting those things as well as his continual imperfections. So it's going to be a continual thing. Fourthly, he says, if repentance were as easy as Satan makes it out to be, there wouldn't be so many people suffering right now in hell. If it were easy... Brooks writes this, and again, this is pretty heavy medicine, but it's true. He says, O oh soul, is it good going to hell? Is it good dwelling with the devouring fire, with everlasting burnings? Is it good to be forever separated from the blessed and glorious presence of God and saints and to be forever shut out from those good things of eternal life, which are so many that they exceed number, so great that they, that they exceed measure, so precious that they exceed all estimation? We know it is the greatest misery that can befall the sons of men. And would they not prevent this by repentance if it were such an easy thing to repent as Satan would have it? Well then, do not run the hazard of losing God, Christ, heaven, and your soul forever by hearkening to this device of Satan. I think that's good counsel. Because again, remember, if we continually listen to him and we continually sin... That may show that we don't really know him. Uh, the Puritans were very strong on this. You know, we, we all are faced with various sins that we have to fight against. And we may fall to them several times in our lifetime and maybe continuously. But we keep getting up. We keep repenting. We keep moving forward. If we're living in any of those sins, embracing any of those sins, not turning from them, and content to just let them dwell in our lives, then we may fall into this category where we should really think about, do we really love the Lord if we always are doing this thing that offends Him, or many things that offend Him, without fighting against it, without repenting of it? I, I hope you see the difference. Well, then, here's the last point. We need to remember that the one who tells us that repentance is so easy, before we sin, is the same one who's going to tell us afterwards how difficult it is. You know that's true because we've all experienced this. So this is what Brooks writes. He's, he will say, is it easy to turn from some... Out now, this is what the devil will say. Is it easy to turn from some outward act of sin to which you have been addicted? Do you not remember that you have often complained against such and such particular sins? and resolve to leave them, and yet to this hour you have not, you cannot? What will it then be to turn from every sin, to mortify and cut off those sins, those darling lusts, 
that are as joints and members, that are as right hands and right eyes. Have you not loved your sins more than your Savior? Have you not preferred earth before heaven? Have you not all along neglected the means of grace and despised the offers of grace and vexed the spirit of grace? There would be no end if I should set before you the infinite evils that you've committed and the innumerable good services that you have omitted and the frequent checks of your own conscience that you have condemned. And therefore, you may well conclude that you can never repent, that you shall never repent. Ah, souls, he that now tempts you to sin by suggesting to you the easiness of repentance will at last work you to despair and present repentance as the hardest work in all the world and as a work as far above man as heaven is above hell, as light is above darkness. Oh, that you were wise to break off your sins by timely repentance." That's good counsel. You know, Jonathan Edwards uh, point, pointed out in one of his sermons, I can't remember the title of it, but I remember reading that Satan has, all again, all these ways of working in our lives, um, but very similar to this, um, what we're talking about here. He'll convince you when you're younger that you have all this time ahead of you. You don't have to get serious about serving the Lord now. Just go ahead and enjoy the world and enjoy the things around you, and that's fine. And then as you listen to him when you get older, then he'll say, too late, you've wasted your life, you know, you've, you've, um, you've had all this time to serve him and you haven't used it for that purpose, it's too late. You might as well just give it up and, and just, you know, it, you just can't do anything about it. Satan has all these different ways of convincing us not to do the right thing, okay? So Brooks's point, let me just summarize is this. When Satan tells, tells you, tells me, you can sin because it's easy to repent. Remember, repentance is beyond your natural ability. You need God's grace to repent. Repentance is turning from every sin, including that sin he's tempting you to do, in order to pursue righteousness. That repentance is something that if you have a saving repentance, it's something you continually do throughout your life. There's always going to be things to turn from and there's going to be that need to get closer to God. And by the way, as we're thinking about this in the context of what we're looking at, if I choose to do that thing, I'm going to get further from Him, and my love is going to decrease. That's why we must continually repent. If, he, if repentance were easy, there wouldn't be so many now in hell. And then finally, he says, realize that Satan is lying to you. Okay, he is lying to you to try to get you to do this. How easy? But once you've committed it, he's going to condemn you as soon as you commit that sin. Don't let him convince you to sin. You know, just counting on the fact that repentance is something that is easy. It is, again, sin is the opposite of repentance. And it's something that God gives to us so that we won't sin. So we don't want to use his grace as an excuse to sin. Well, let's, um, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to... Um, to help us uh, in this area, um, and particularly as we come to the table, as we've been going through this, if you've thought of ways in which the enemy has actually talked you into sinning because of this particular reason or any reason, make sure you repent of that before you come to the table to renew your, your, your commitment to the Lord, your, your uh, covenant you know, with the Lord. Uh, to, to love and follow and trust and serve Him and to repent of, of all of your sins. Let's, let's spend a few moments in prayer.